Hi everyone from wherever you are and welcome to Fabricating Change in Mental, Health, uh, Mental Wellness uh, from Intermediate Unit 1. I'm Don Martin, I'm the Executive Director here at IU1 um, and we welcome you to this 30 minute presentation so we can discuss a little about what's happening here, the exciting things happening in terms of digital fabrication as it relates to our mental wellness programs as well as special education programming here at IU1. Before we get started, there's a few people that I'd like to thank, uh, particularly from the 100 organization. That would be Pukaj Ranjan, who's uh, really been instrumental in through this whole process. Uh, Ryan Kuhn and Ariel Evans from the Pittsburgh 100 organization, as well as Remake Learning and the Grable Foundation for all of the uh, efforts in making this happen. We're just so excited to be selected in one of 12 Pittsburgh videos. Um, and hopefully at the end of this segment, you'll see a little why uh, we're so happy with that and so proud. Also, I'd like to thank our team here at IU1. Uh, none of this work that you're about to hear could have been done without a true team effort, starting with our former executive director, Charles Mahoney, who uh, had the concept and the vision uh, to bring this program to fruition, uh, as well as Jenny Lent, our director of curriculum, Joe Mahoney uh, from our newest uh, addition here uh, at IU1, our newest department, a, a division of mental health um, and social services. Uh, so we thank them. Sarah Darzo, who is uh, out there listening somewhere, who is uh, our design and innovation coordinator. Um, Nancy Stahlschmidt, who's one of our curriculum specialists who was instrumental in starting this. And of course, two folks that are uh, off camera today, Alyssa Hirsch, uh, who is one of our coordinators as well, our STEM coordinator, as well as Matt Uvan, who's uh, our engineer today. So we thank all of those. I'd well, like to give you a little uh, brief history of intermediate units, uh, particularly IU1, before we get started, because the biggest question I get uh, whenever I'm out and about is, what is an intermediate unit and what do you do? Um, so intermediate units uh, are educational service agencies. Uh, many of you uh, in your respective uh, state or region uh, may have those. They're, uh, they have different names, obviously, throughout uh, our country. Uh, but there are 29 intermediate units throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And of course, Intermediate Unit 1 uh, was the first, and it was piloted in 1971. And the reason for uh, the pilot taking place in this three-county region, which I'll talk about in a minute, was due to the high number of special ed population that our region had. Um, from that point, it has really evolved. Uh, I will tell you that IU1 encompasses three counties, which is uh, Fayette, Green, and Washington counties, which is the southwest corridor um, of uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, we have 25 wonderful districts that we work with day in and day out. And uh, that all started with an idea of special education. And, uh, and again, that has evolved. Since then, um, when we fast forward to the present day, um, IU1 uh, assists districts in a multitude of areas, uh, particularly with, a, and I'm happy to say that we continue that special education service and that support to our districts as well as uh, support, we, we do things with business support. We have consortiums through energy consortiums. Um, there's a healthcare consortium that is run through this intermediate unit. So anything that we do to support districts, our districts in particular, and then districts that may be on the outskirts of IU1, uh, we certainly, uh, we, we're certainly interested in helping them. We're a true educational service agency. Um, mental health um, has been, again, our most recent addition here, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, but I really would like to take you back and tell you a little story about how we got to where we're at in terms of uh, fabricating change in the mental wellness. And probably many of you are wondering how, is, uh, how do those uh, things fit into that same title in that same sentence. Uh, we wondered that as well um, a few years ago, but uh, since then it's become uh, just common names around here. Uh, about seven years ago, six and a half years ago at Intermediate Unit 1, um, we started to, uh, we operate four, three campus schools, I'm sorry, at the time we were operating four campus schools. And just to give you an idea, these are schools that are owned and operated from IU1, but the sending uh, school districts are 25 districts that send these students to us uh, who have uh, perhaps a multitude of issues, uh, special education, learning support, emotional support, therapeutic emotional support, comprehensive therapeutic emotional support, which we will get into, students who uh, may suffer from or, or have uh, autism um, or have physical or uh, mental disabilities. Um, uh, many times uh, we service those students um, uh, in lieu of our districts, um, and uh, that's the areas that we specialize in here at IU1. Uh, about six and a half years ago, uh, we started to uh, 
do a, a really preliminary study and it took a real good look at what our campus schools, what we were doing in our campus schools. And one of the things that we noticed uh, was that as districts were sending these students to us for uh, a non-traditional learning experience, uh, we realized that in many cases we were providing a traditional, more of a traditional learning experience to these students, which was creating some disruptions. Um, and so we knew that we needed to do something and we needed to do something quick. Uh, and so uh, at the time when I was the assistant executive director, um, uh, my boss had, had uh, gave me the authority um, to uh, put together a team and to really go out and study this. And we used our colonial school, uh, which is located in Grindstone, uh, Pennsylvania, as our pilot school. Now the colonial school uh, consists of, uh, the thing that we liked about colonial was that it really had, um, uh, had several different uh, types of students that came, uh, ranging from just alternative ed, regular education students, um, all the way up to, again, our comprehensive therapeutic emotional support. And those are students that in many cases are one step away from a hospitalization program, and they suffer from a variety of, of mental health and social emotional learning issues. When we started to uh, really take a look at uh, what we were doing in our programs, we realized again that we had to make a change. Uh, we put together what's called a design team concept. That was developed through the Consortium for Public Education uh, several years ago. We had used that uh, for a while. The Consortium is a group that works here in the Pittsburgh metropolitan area and works with districts inside and outside uh, of Pittsburgh and gives it a wide variety of schools with, uh, with some diverse backgrounds. And so we had some experience with design team and bringing uh, different panels of folks together. So as we put that design team together, that was a mix of teachers, paraprofessionals, um, administrators, custodians, police officers, students, uh, parents. Uh, we, we tried to have a real wide variety of people on this design team. And the one question we had was that how can we make this school culture and this climate better? Uh, instead of us doing this from the top down administratively, we wanted to hear from folks from all walks of life in that building. And we certainly did. Um, uh, folks, I can remember that first meeting, it was uh, quiet for about the first three minutes. And then uh, once folks started to get comfortable, they certainly let us know how they felt. I think the other thing that really helped us through this process, and, and um, Nancy Stalschman, who I mentioned before, had brought this book to our attention called The Third Teacher. Some of you may have that. Um, 79 ways you can use uh, design to transform teaching and learning. And it's a really simple read, pretty thick book, but a re really simple read. And we started to take a look at what we can do to make this building better. And really, there was very, very, uh, there were very elementary things um, and things that you really just take for granted every day that people wanted to see change. Um, the kids wanted beanbags. The kids wanted to be able to perhaps watch Sports Center at lunch. They wanted cable TV. They wanted things that didn't cost a lot. Um, and so from that point, we started a phase of really transforming this school with some of those really, really um, small things that we took for granted. Uh, and the kids really embraced that. Uh, from that point in time, and I'll talk about a few partners today um, that, that we picked up along the way who were with us throughout this process. But this then started with a very small grant from the Claude Worthington Benedum Foundation located out of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it was a very small grant. Dr. Jim DeNovo, who is a, uh, was a great, is a great supporter of Intermediate Unit 1, um, had that vision to come and listen to us as we pitched what we wanted to do. And uh, we were able to create our first makerspace. And our first makerspace, I wish I could show you pictures of that, is nothing to the state-of-the-art fab labs that I'm going to talk about. Our first makerspace consisted of construction paper and glue and scissors and um, things that you know, glitter and, and cardboard and things that we could do for molding and things that we could do for prototyping for students. And it was a very small room. We were very proud of it. Uh, and we began to have teachers integrate students into that room. We began to do professional development, trying to take teachers away from the books and the pencils and kind of the rigmarole of a, a traditionalized learning um, atmosphere. Um, while we were doing that, we were getting rid of the projectors and the, the really, really traditional things. And uh, that was a, a real, real game changer for us. It was a game changing experience, even though it wasn't all that intrinsic, it wasn't all that expensive to do. Uh, in the process of that, uh, the Chevron Corporation, um, nationwide, had come out with a, uh, I'm sorry, worldwide, had come out with a 
grant proposal for Fab Labs. Uh, now, I'll tell you, some, I'm somewhat embarrassed that the first time that I've, I heard of a Fab Lab, I really didn't know what it was, and I'm not sure that many around here did. So when we looked and did our research and happened to have discussions with Chevron, we had realized that this was a state-of-the-art digital fabrication. Um, that consisted of laser cutters and wood cutters or CNC routers and um, uh, soldering things and uh, things that deal with electronics and all of these things with, hand, with hands-on 3D printers and ways that students can do prototyping. And so we had uh, become very interested in, in, in looking at this proposal and we went through a 16-month uh, period of our team working with Chevron, with the local Chevron uh, folks, with folks from the National um, Chevron Corporation. In that 16-month process, uh, we didn't know if we were going to be uh, become a recipient of one of these. They, they were giving 10 worldwide uh, fab labs, uh, funding 10 worldwide fab labs. We didn't know if we were going to be a recipient, but I can tell you that during that 16 months, we learned a lot about ourselves. So whether we got it or whether we didn't, we knew that we were going to be better off and a better organization for this. Um, fortunately, at the end of the road, we were awarded um, about $1.2 million to put in our first state-of-the-art fab lab. And we knew exactly where we were going to put that, and that was at our colonial site, the school that I originally told you we did our first study in terms of school climate. Uh, there was an old library there that nobody really used. Uh, there were a lot of Encyclopedia Britannicas that were old and um, falling apart, and we converted this into this state-of-the-art fab lab, and the library sits right in the middle of the school. Everything was great. Um, we, we did the construction. We, uh, we really went um, over the top with it, uh, and we had all this shiny equipment. We had this wonderful fab lab. We had all of these things. We had a grand opening, and we were all excited, and then uh, a short time after that, we said, okay, well, what do we do now? Uh, we have the fab lab. We have all of these things. Uh, what do we do with these students and how do we integrate this uh, into uh, the curriculum? And we started with our alternative ed students. And there's a reason for that because we knew that they, we thought that they were the first or they were the bunch that would benefit the most from this. Uh, these were regular education students who may have been uh, not invited back to their school for an expulsion or for doing something, having too many discipline referrals. Um, but they were adhering to the rules where we were at at Colonial. So we started off with our alternative ed students and we started to bring them in. Now in terms of curriculum, we didn't have a set curriculum. Our, our curriculum department was working diligently towards this. Uh, we didn't have a set curriculum and, um, and probably a short time later, we heard from a, a company called Invention Land, which was 45 minutes down the road in a small area called RIDC Park on the outskirts of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so we, uh, Started to collaborate with InventionLand. Uh, InventionLand was just coming out with a nine-step innovation and entrepreneurship process. Um, they had a contest that they were promoting, and for those of you that ever watched Shark Tank, I'm a big fan of that. Um, the contest was very similar to what you see um, on the Shark Tank show. And so we became very interested in having discussions with InventionLand, and we realized that that was the curriculum that we wanted to use. And so it was really a great marriage and a great fit at the time in bringing that company together with IU1. Uh, things were going great. We had our alternative ed students. Um, all the while, uh, we, we did integrate our special education students. The one group that we did not integrate uh, immediately into our fab lab were the students who were having mental health issues and students that had some, uh, again, social emotional learning um, setbacks. Um, and there was a reason for that. Um, we were concerned about students with sharp instruments. We were concerned with this equipment. This was, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment was, uh, was in our lab. And we wanted to make sure that we were pretty methodical with this and we were going to be deliberate enough to where we were training these students to go in. Uh, that went on for uh, a, probably about six months, maybe a little less. Everything was going great, but we still had a lot of questions from students outside of alternative ed asking to get into the fab lab more. The alternative ed students wanted to be in there. We treated it as a, an itinerant where students would go in for one period uh, and come out, um, and that didn't seem to be enough. But I will tell you that the, uh, the game changer of all of this um, was, was a day that I had visited uh, Colonial with uh, our director of mental health, Joe Mahoney, who at that time was a supervisor of mental health. And it's not 
uncommon when you go to these schools to see students who are having difficulty in the hallway uh, with paraprofessionals, with social workers, with psychologists. These students have a lot of support. But it's not uncommon to see these students really, really struggling. Um, and one day, uh, as I was up there with Joe, and we were walking through the hallway, we had noticed a, a student, and his name was Robert, and I didn't know his name at the time, and he was a third grader at the time. We're talking about three and a half years ago. Uh, Robert was on the ground, and he was really having a difficult time, and there were probably about three or four adults that were really trying to assist him. And it was one of those moments where, um, as an administrator, um, I wasn't the principal of the building, and should I intervene or shouldn't I? And in many cases, I wouldn't intervene because I would let the administration handle that. For whatever reason that day, as I walked about 10 feet past Robert, uh, I stopped, and I turned around and went back, and began to engage in a conversation with him. Now, he wasn't one too bit happy that I was there as the fourth or fifth adult, and he certainly let me know about it. But as I was thinking or trying to think quick off my feet on how we can get Robert de-escalated, I thought of the Fab Lab, and I said, Robert, if you trust me, I want to show you something cool today. Just come on, take you know, follow me down the hallway, uh, me and Mr. Mahoney down the hallway, and let us show you something cool. I think you're really going to like it. Uh, he was reluctant at first, uh, but he was intrigued, and he followed us um, along with his social worker and paraprofessionals and teachers, went into our fab lab where there was an alternative ed, uh, classroom in there, and uh, one of our top-notch teachers, Kevin McKee, happened to be in there, and it was just a perfect scenario because he was doing something with the 3D printers. And I asked Mr. McKee if he could show my man Robert here a little bit about the 3D printer and explain this to it. Um, and I have to tell you, um, that, you know, we hear cliches all the time in education, but I have to tell you that um, that was one of those aha moments for me that here was a student who 45 seconds to a minute before that was absolutely escalated. Um, it took us less than a minute to get into the fab lab, and in less than another minute he was de-escalated, um, and he was asking questions um, using inquiry and really asking questions about the 3D printer on how it works and how it operates uh, and what it does and what could he use his favorite color, could he make his favorite characters, could he do things on this 3D printer. Now that doesn't sound like much whenever you're looking at a regular education situation. Whenever you're looking at that situation that I just explained with Robert, uh, that was what we call a game changer. And uh, I looked at Joe at that time, and I looked at the other adults in the room, um, and our eyes could really do a lot of speaking with one another, and I thought to myself at that point, what have we been doing all this time in keeping the, this away from these students, particularly with mental health needs? Um, Robert also had suffered from bipolar disorder, and uh, there was some schizophrenia as well that was diagnosed. Um, but we kept him in that lab that day, and we really, really noticed the difference. He was absolutely de-escalated. He was asking questions. And from that point on, uh, probably within a day, we had a very large meeting and said, we're missing the boat. Um, we need to, instead of trying to keep these students out of this lab, this is a way that these students could learn non-traditionally. We need to bring them in here immediately. And so our quest started with students with, again, social, emotional learning and mental health issues, along with uh, our students with special ed and alternative ed. The problem was that we couldn't, we had, we had one fab lab and, and just not enough time in the day. Uh, the kids when they were in, uh, the students when they were in the fab lab, we noticed that their behaviors were just nil. I mean, they, uh, in fact, we used a, a company out of Penn State, and we still use it, called Chartlytics, which is a real-time digitized running record. And uh, because the teachers and the fab lab workers and the social workers were saying that their behaviors were, uh, there were so few in, uh, behavioral issues, if any, we wanted to make sure that we saw this and we were, we were charting this. And so we just took this really globally and we started to do uh, some charting with Chartlytics. Um, and we realized that that was the case. But the problem on the flip side of that was, is that when these students went back to their traditional classrooms and learning, and the teachers would say, open your books to page 25 and let's do the odd problems in math, there was an absolute issue and outburst. And so we had to address that immediately. 
Um, and this is a work in progress. And so we, we started to do uh, dabble with personalized learning. Uh, we started to talk with some of our districts that happen to be doing a lot with personalized learning. Uh, we, we, uh, we have a personalized learning network through Pittsburgh and now the Southwest Personalized Learning Network, which we're heavily involved with. And also we want to do some things with project-based learning. And I'm happy to say that as I say this is a work in progress, we're sending folks out to be trained, and we're a true train the trainer here at IE1. So we are, we're able to go out, and um, uh, our folks are going to be able to go out and get trained in PBL and come back and train our teachers. Uh, what our goal is, and we're certainly not there yet, our goal is to do project-based learning throughout the entire school day, based around the projects that students do in the fab lab. Let me get back to uh, the students with mental health and, and SEL, um, because I think this is really important. When we started to do uh, the fab lab experiences with these children, one thing that we noticed as we were doing observations is that our social workers, um, and, and in our CTES, our Comprehensive Therapeutic Emotional Support, that program requires a tremendous amount of interaction from social workers and psychologists. We have to address the root of their mental issues uh, as we're educating them or before we can educate them appropriately. And so as we followed these students and we observed these students, uh, what we noticed to, to no fault of our social workers, just through repetition and just through patterns and just from the way it was done before, we had uh, group therapy sessions that we would sit in that were in pretty cold, kind of dark rooms, um, and we're asking uh, students and, you know, school-age students to have conversations, and meaningful conversations. And we noticed there wasn't a whole bunch. And then we came up with another idea with our social workers, and they assisted us with this process, as well as Joe uh, Mahoney and his department, and said, what if we did group therapy while using the fab lab? At first, that sounded a little crazy, but when you think about it, oftentimes when we're working in groups and working with our hands and doing all of these things, that's when we tend to talk the most. And so uh, we said, let's give it a try. So we got our social workers together. Um, we had a group of social workers and said, look, we're going to train you in digital fabrication and design. Uh, they looked at us like we had two heads at that point. Um, they, some of them said, look, I didn't sign on to this. I'm a social worker. Uh, but as we explained this more, uh, all of them jumped in with both feet, and they decided that they wanted to participate in this training. So our social workers, many of them in our, in our campus schools, are trained in digital fabrication and design, as well as having that expertise in social work. And so now, um, as we move forward, as we move forward from that point, not only do we do the instruction with these students in the fab lab, we begin to do... Um, group therapy with these students in the fab lab. And the results were amazing. Um, students were talking openly. There were a lot of conversations among students. There was a lot of conversation with a social worker as we encouraged our social workers and psychologists to become immersed and involved in the projects, um, as well as the, the teachers of these students um, in kind of completing that cycle. And so we, we've had a lot of success with that. Um, Again, the issue, um, I'd be lying if I said that everything was perfect here, because the issue that we're, we're dealing with now is really uh, outside of that group therapy and outside of that fab lab. I think we've gotten a lot better. Um, I have to tell you that as we piloted that colonial school in terms of uh, cultural changes and school climate shifts, um, the one thing I didn't mention is that uh, that school, the walls were originally brown, there were two shades of brown, and I can't make that up. Um, these students didn't have an identity. Their schools, as we sat in the design teams, as we were moving forward with the fab labs, we continued those design team meetings, and we continued to listen to students and teachers and staff. And one of the things they said was, we do not have uh, an identity. And so, you know, when our home school has a mascot. Our home school has a school color. When people ask me where I go to school, what am I supposed to tell them? That's a very, very relevant point that I don't think as an adult we really, or I never thought of. So we went out on a quest and we uh, decided that we were going to give these schools an identity. So now we have the Colonial Phoenix, um, which we have a, a couple of samples of things that students do. So it's not uncommon to see these in our student stores. Uh, we have pencils made, we have cups made, 
The teachers will wear, wear shirts on dress down days and everyone identifies Colonial with the Phoenix. The colors originally we had about 12 colors. Uh, we told the students we had to really kind of tone that down and so now our colors are maroon and gray um, and I think there's a, a little bit of white and maybe another uh, shade of gold but, um, but pretty much maroon and gray. So then we had um, painting activities where our students were involved in really, really be beautifying that building and updating that building. Um, our administration was tremendous through that process. We had just hired a, a principal at that time. He was really uh, instrumental in that process. And once we realized that we created that identity with these students, they began to become very proud of what they had done, and very proud of their school. And we started to do things with parents. We started to have open houses. We started to have parent-teacher conferences with th which things that didn't exist before. And these students felt like they belonged there. And I should have said that before we got into the mental health component, but that really led up to where we're at. Um, I'm happy to say that along with that Chevron grant, uh, the gracious efforts of Chevron, we also were able to um, uh, obtain a mobile fab lab. So uh, a mobile fab lab that, that travels, uh, initially started to travel amongst three counties, and now it travels throughout the entire country. Our mobile fab lab is extremely busy. It rarely is in our parking lot, and it goes out to visit schools. And what the, the whole concept was, uh, as an educational service agency, we were going out to train schools and show schools the impact of what a fab lab can do and what a makerspace can do for students and for a school climate culture. I'm happy to say that that uh, at IU1 uh, was something that our schools were doing. Um, we have several of our schools that are way ahead of the curve. Um, uh, most of our schools, if not all of them, have makerspaces, and many of them have makerspaces that is just as good as the one I explained, if not better. Um, we have several trainings uh, now for our teachers. We open the doors, uh, our training, our fab labs, a couple times a week, where we have full classes of teachers and administrators that come up to the, um, to the fab lab. And it's really important, if you're an administrator out there listening, this is really important because you are the difference. Um, teachers love this, and teachers always come to us, but we know, I know as a former administrator, it really falls within the confines of the administrator of that building and being able to accept this and promote this. And so we have classes for administrators that may do, may uh, have little to do with how to use a laser cutter, but everything to do with how to accept this and embrace this and bring this concept in your district. Again, many of our schools have been uh, uh, are, are way ahead of the curve with this. And we learn off of them just as much as they learn off of us. Uh, we also open our Fab Lab up for evening events. Um, we do have uh, family evenings where we bring families in to do a lot of different things. Um, these certainly don't have to be students with mental health or any uh, type of disability. These are families in our communities. Uh, I would hope that we will do that a little more in the coming year. We have plans to do that. And also our mobile Fab Lab, we just like it to show up in places. So Around here in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania, we have things called county fairs, and the county fairs, uh, our fab lab goes and sets up shop, and it really is a very, very popular entity uh, with that. Um, along the way, uh, as I continue to explain the success that we've had, along the way, we have had a lot of different help from a lot of different partners. I mentioned some of them. Um, you know, we're working with a company called Teamology and Project Team, and that is out of Penn State University. Um, it really deals with social emotional learning. So our students really get a dose of that within the curriculum. So that's really beneficial for us as we work with these different partners. Um, we're working with a company called eColors right now. Um, it's not uncommon for folks to see us with our uh, eColors uh, on. It's a personality assessment. Uh, at Equilibria.com, and we're using that right now as we group students together for projects to make sure that we don't have too many students uh, type, that may have type A personalities. We have a wide variety of students and how we group them. And so it really has been um, an exciting venture. Um, I would like to mention that, uh, that we this concept of working with students with mental health, as successful it is, as it has been, um, it really wasn't all that difficult for us to do took a lot of help, it took a lot of partnerships. Uh, we were partnering with the Regional Education Laboratory or the REL 
out of Washington, D.C., and we have met with um, um, those folks uh, of quite a few times as they have come out and visited our fab lab. Our Colonial Lab was so successful in this process that uh, through the local efforts of Chevron and Leanne Wainwright uh, from the Chevron Corporation and Trip Oliver and his group um, located a, a few miles from us, um, Chevron had, uh, after they had observed this, they uh, invested local funding into an additional fab lab at our Waynesburg site. And our Waynesburg site is a school that has 100% special education. Um, it does not have alternative education where we have regular ed students in there. Um, and so we placed our next, our second um, state-of-the-art fab lab in our Waynesburg site that has about um, 90 to 100 students in that building. And again, students with very diverse backgrounds and we're working with those students day in and day out. Um, our fab lab teacher there, John Kopp, does a wonderful job uh, with those students, and those teachers are trained, those social workers are trained, and there's never a day that we go to Waynesburg without fab lab isn't just hopping with a lot of energy, and the kids are so excited to show us what they do. Um, we've also been recognized, to uh, because of the work that we do with our students. Everything is student-based and student-centered, and so a lot of... Uh, uh, entities will come to us and ask us to do designs or to do uh, awards. We've done several awards for um, different Pittsburgh-based organizations, and one of them right here is uh, one of the awards that we've done. We've done a lot larger awards, and, um, and, and really what we're looking for is projects for our students to, to work on throughout the process, because again, everything we, we want to be student-based. Um, what are our plans? Uh, well, let me tell you that uh, our, our plans for the future, again, very exciting. Our third and final um, campus school is our laboratory school, which is located in Washington, just outside of Washington, Pennsylvania. Um, that school is, uh, again, 100% special education, and those students have um, mental and physical uh, defects, and they have some uh, inability uh, inabilities to, uh, to function normally and physically and mentally and our teachers are top-notch out there. We are in the process, again, through the local funding of Chevron and putting our third state-of-the-art fab lab. In fact, that is, uh, we're beginning construction on that very soon. And uh, that uh, fab lab will be uh, absolutely ADA compliant. These are students that will be in wheelchairs or students that may have uh, vision issues or hearing uh, problems um, in addition to uh, other issues. And so we've really taken our time with that in working with key people and making sure that that building is going to be uh, compliant and, and really able to be accessed by all of these students. Uh, that construction will begin very soon. We've also, uh, through uh, Chevron's efforts, we've purchased an additional fab lab. Um, we do a lot of work with, we're uh, about 40 minutes, from where I'm sitting, we're about 40 minutes from the West Virginia border. So we've done a lot of work with West Virginia schools in the northern panhandle of West Virginia. Of course, through the efforts of the Benetton Foundation, uh, we've been able to make those relationships, and those cross-state relationships are so important. And we're working with West Virginia, uh, really taking a look at that mental health component and doing some trainings uh, currently with those folks. And uh, with the addition of, a, of, a, of an additional fab lab, we'll be able to cover those territories as well as servicing our districts uh, as we move forward. Um, we're, we're absolutely doing a whole bunch. Um, the, our theme this year, I'll show you uh, another resource. Our theme this year is Disrupt. It's, uh, we, we've uh, taken this book, Luke Williams. This is not a new book, but uh, we really want to make, we really have made a lot of disruptions in education here at IU1 over the course of the last five or six years. Uh, we want our folks to understand where we're coming from. So uh, we're using this as a guideline this year, and it's Disrupt, Think the Unthinkable. And that's what we want our folks to do, because um, some of those thoughts that we have uh, really turn out to be a reality, and they're very, very exciting to us. Uh, a lot of people will ask me uh, during this presentation that we've done, you know, quite a few times, a lot of people will ask me at the end, what, um, you know, what do we need to know? How do we get this started? How do we get a fab lab? And it's not really about how do you get a fab lab. What it is is, how do you get ideas? And how do you get those generated? And how do you get enough energy to move those forward? And it's not through the adults. I have to tell you, this is really through the eyes of these students. Um, we are just so fortunate to have the, the students um, 
the administrators that we have, the personnel, the support staff here at IU1, it is a true team effort from this concept. We have had to ask our phys ed teachers to alter their schedules so students go into fab lab. We have had to alter lunch uh, schedules. We have, have had to talk with cafeteria employees. Um, so when I say it's a true team effort, um, if those folks are, are not happy and those folks don't want to participate, they don't want to see the big picture, then we have a problem. And so I would tell any administrator or any a person who can have that impact watching is to make sure that this is an effort that's not from the top down and something that you're listening and listening intently to people because we've learned a whole bunch from groups that we may have not ever heard from before, including our students. Um, and that's really the bread and butter of this organization um, are our kids. We, uh, I, I should have mentioned this before, but we operate early intervention programs here at IU1, so we go from uh, pre-K all the way up until students that are 21 years old. We serve special education students all the way up until they're 21 years old. We are currently looking at um, career readiness and career awareness. Um, that's a big concept. That's a big goal for us this year because in putting all this into play and practice, at the end of the day, we want these students to have careers and lives after they leave our facilities and after they leave our 25 districts. So we're working very intently with our schools on that. Um, we're doing a lot with career readiness right now. Fortunately, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, through the efforts of the Pennsylvania Department of Education, has recognized this, and, and there, is a lot, there are a lot of programs and supports that are coming down the line with this. Um, and so, uh, and we work very collaboratively with our IUs. Uh, the 28 other IUs, I can't say enough about those folks. We learn from them every day. Uh, we, there are several uh, intermediate units that have really specialized in mental health that we have discussions with weekly, sometimes monthly, uh, but we continue to learn from one another and it's a true effort in, in how we move forward. I would like to, uh, I, I, we covered a lot here in the short period of time that we had. Um, I'm, I'm always uh, open for questions. Um, and if you can't reach me on this channel, uh, you can certainly um, write me at um, don.martin at iu1.org. Um, and also Jenny Lent, who is also oversees our fab labs. You can reach her at Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y dot Lent at IU1 dot org. And certainly we love to share our story. I think you've noticed that. Um, we really like to brag about our kids uh, with all the great work that they've done. And uh, we're certainly happy to help uh, you or some of you that are out there that may be doing this and doing some things that we hadn't mentioned. would love to learn from you as well. Again, on behalf of Intermediate Unit 1 and all of our staff, on behalf of the 100 organization, on behalf of the folks that we've worked with and all of our partners, we thank you for watching and we thank you for all of your support uh, and we look forward to doing bigger and better things in the future here at IU1. Thanks.